she said, this saved us. This helped mm -hmm. us understand this whole process. And they were so appreciative. She says, I'm never throwing this napkin away. And it was probably the most um, inspiring um, experience of my life to see how picking my words wisely, listening to him and understanding where they're coming from helped me help him achieve better health and perhaps help that mental health of the spouse. It was quite a story, quite an experience. Welcome to episode 19 of the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast slash show. I'm your host, Brittany Nicole. In today's episode, we will be speaking with Rebecca Schaefer. Rebecca is a speech pathologist and the author of one of my all-time favorite, and by the way, award-winning books, The Zen of Listening. Mindful Communication in the Age of Distraction. This book, along with Nonviolent Communication, were the two books that really impacted me, I believe, the most out of all of the 63 plus self help books that I read when going through my personal development journey. And so the fact that Rebecca accepted my request to be interviewed and come on to the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast excited me to no end. So I am beyond thrilled to have her on the show. She drops a lot of nuggets and gives you some useful strategies and tips for how you can become a better listener. So without further ado, here is Rebecca Schaefer. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast and show. Um, I honestly was shocked that you replied to my request for this interview because to me you are such a major or your book made such a major impact in my life so the book is the zen of listening for anyone who is listening or watching um, and i will also give the subtitle so it's the zen of listening the subtitle is mindful communication in the age of distraction your book is so timely when did you first publish this book how long has it been since it was published? Boy, 2000. And then it came out with a couple editions after that. But 2000 is when it came out. And it still is very timely. Uh, oh, yeah. I have to say, I did record a couple years ago an audible version. So it is slightly revised. So people can listen to the audiobook I'm listening. Isn't that an interesting thought? A book on listening. Listening, listen. listening to a book on listening, yes. <laughs> Well, I stumbled upon your book about, mm, gosh, it was before I started my business. Honestly, your book and nonviolent communication were the two books that kind of triggered um, a passion in me to start my own business, mm -hmm. The Catalyst for Change. So thank you, because I don't know if I would have started my business if it wasn't for your book, along with a couple other key books that I read. But it made such a major impact in my life. Because until I read your book, I never realized how much I was talking and not listening and also how I was filtering pretty much all the information. I mean, we, all of us filter, but I was putting some serious filters on how I interpreted the message of others and also reflected on my inner dialogue. And when I coach people now, I use your phrase, what movie right? Are you watching? You talk about instead of just jumping into the conversation, just observe it like you're watching a movie. I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, but I love your book and I am so excited to talk to you about this. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, um, your occupation, how you got started, what made you write this book, just all out on the table for us. I'll turn it oh, over boy. to you. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a speech and language pathologist, and I began working in the hospitals. And uh, I happened to receive a lot of referrals from neurology, from psychology, uh, pediatrics, uh, many different departments for people who had troubles concentrating and focusing. 
And I determined that part of the trouble was if they were having difficulties listening, they were having difficulties processing information. So I started really moving more toward that cognitive end of how the brain processes information, how we express ourselves. So that's one small piece. But then I started to have some, a combination of some interesting episodes that had to do with listening in general. For example, my uh, boss asked me to prepare a course on listening for the hospital because they were very much into risk averse and very much into liabilities, you know. And so I was putting this together, cobbling this, uh, this together, thinking, well, I'm a speech pathologist. I must be a great listener. Well, I determined that over the years, I wasn't such a great listener. I was good clinically. But when it came to relationships, I could use a little tune-up. So I started learning more about it. But I also noticed that the way that, that listening was being positioned as a training tool was a very manual-like mechanical way of listening. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't very authentic and genuine. I would go to uh, my, some of my friends had companies that they were experiencing some communication training. And I said, can I sit in on one of your active listening training modules. I just want to see what's out there and what's working. And I was aghast to see how artificial and mm -hmm. how mechanical and how rote this kind of training was. And I really didn't feel that people were walking away better listeners, really, you know? Yeah. And then I knew at the same time, many physicians who were quite good at listening. They were very popular with their patients. And so I would interview them and I would say, how do you do it? What is it, you know, what do you do? You, your patients love you. Are they all successful? Are they all uh, wonderful outcomes? Not necessarily, but you relate, you connect with them. And when I interviewed the patients, they would say, yes, he makes me feel like I'm the only person in the world when I'm with him. Mm. So I, so many, many factors. I also had some interesting incidents that I'll be glad to share with you if you're interested that, of course, that yeah. brought about the importance of people needing to hear each other wholeheartedly and for people to be understood, mm -hmm. you know? So many things occurred at about the same time to make me sit down and write this book. And you talk about the Zen of listening. You talk about mindful listening. So explain mm -hmm. the difference between just being an active listener, I guess, and a mindful listener. What, what is the difference between the two? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a very good question. Many of us who have had trainings in companies, how to listen or read, pick up on the active listening approach. But as I said, I call it, act like you're listening approach. Yeah. That's the active listening approach. Right? So it's the head Mindful. nods. It's the exactly. audible. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. sure. <laughs> the body right. language. But I, well, yeah, exactly. But what I found, Brittany, is those things really don't help you listen better. No. And they kind of fool the speaker into thinking that they've been heard. Yeah. So mindful listening my definition came about from all these interviews and experiences with people on both sides, speakers and listeners, to come up with this one definition. It's many pieces, but number one, the one most important aspect probably of mindful listening is that ability to get the whole message, mm -hmm. to uh, not only listen to the words, which could have many interpretations, and we're not very good actually at picking words to match our intention perfectly. You know, words just don't right. do it justice. So we watch, we take in the nonverbals, we listen to the tone, we allow the pauses, and that helps us really understand that person so much better. Okay? A second ingredient to mindful listening is that ability to sustain your attention and focus over time. And this is one of the most challenging pieces because when we are trying to listen to someone, our internal distractions yep. start to overshoot and, and cloud the message. And that can be biases, judgments, what that person is wearing, past experiences with that person, assumptions, I mean, it's just a huge mass of distractions mm -hmm. internally that 
prevent us from really understanding that person. Also, external distractions also get in the way. But this is one of the, uh, the essential elements of listening is to improve that ability to concentrate and focus. Um, the other thing is we need to be okay with silence and that's really hard for people. Yes, yes. A few seconds you know, feels like a you, very long time. Yeah. It certainly is. I start off some of my talks, by the way, in front of a group and I'm just standing there. Just standing. <laughs> And to watch the audience start to squirm, you know, because, whoa, you know, this is silence and I'm not comfortable with that. Yes. And that's one of the things that gets in the way, because if you let someone express themselves and allow that pause time, well, that's where the gold is, Brittany. Mm -hmm. because it will then get to a deeper level. They'll see that, wow, there's some assurances here for me really to express deeply how I feel if we allow those pause those pauses, we can get, get to the goal. Mm -hmm. The other thing is mindful listening helps the speaker feel valued and respected. And I think that's a great outcome of any conversation. Yes. You know, whether we agree with them or not, to walk away saying, hey, you know, I don't quite know your point of view or understand it too much, but I'm trying. And I appreciate you sharing it with me. It gives me something to think about. And the final element of being a mindful listener is being able to listen to oneself, to pick your words as closely as possible to your intention, to watch out for rambling and interrupting and mm -hmm. denying someone their experience or giving unwanted advice. <laughs> yes. So imagine a mindful listener does all those things well, and I'm still working at it. I've got a ways to go but at least I have a standard that I hope others can use. Yeah, that's wonderful. And self-awareness, being aware, seems to be the foundation for so many things. Emotional intelligence, for example. If you're an emotionally intelligent individual, you should be aware. And then that plays into your listening. You should be an effective, communication, uh, effective communicator if you are emotionally intelligent. You're also aware of the filters that you place on things. And it's very hard to be an observer because it's very natural for us to make assumptions. It's how we make sense of the world around us. But it can also be very dangerous, too, if we allow false assumptions, especially judgments about other people to kind of play into that. Or we're projecting our insecurities onto that person you know it's it's extremely complicated and it's mind-blowing to me that we don't have this in our education systems we're so heavily focused on iq and stem that we allow these essential skills to just not, i mean it's <laughs> i don't know it's it's crazy to me would you not agree i agree a hundred percent it's a, it's a real shame that not only is listening kind of kicked in the corner as an essential skill to learn early on, mm -hmm. but so is critical thinking yeah. and learning how to listen for the points or the facts that help you build an argument or help you build a point of view that you can support. Mm, that's so true. You know, so... Yes, mindful listening, yeah. critical thinking, we need to teach those. Uh, it's interesting that m most of the people who come to me are adults saying, gee, you know, I realize how important it is to be a good listener. I wish I had this kind of experience in college yeah. or even in middle school, you know, mm -hmm. where you can mm -hmm. really be appreciate it. And now they're having to learn after many headaches and heart heartaches in their lives. Well, even the school systems, since, we're, since I already brought that up, they don't really teach us how to be a critical thinker either. It's like, this is how we want you to process this information. Outside of that, we don't really, you know, they say be a critical thinker, be a problem solver, but then they give us these boxes that we have to stay within. These are the boundaries of this. And I see that with um, people I know that are parents right now or teachers, these math problems, it's like you have to do it this way or they count it incorrect. It's like, 
<laughs> That's mind blowing to me. Whatever happened to having the right answer, it doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you have the right answer. But that, okay, that's not good enough. Uh -huh. It's not good enough anymore. So I want to pull some quotes from your book. And when I tell you this was challenging, I started highlighting in this book and I had about seven or eight highlights with just in chapter one. And I'm like, okay, I can't pull all of these quotes out and go through them or I would be reading your book because it's very, the value that you put in this book is so condensed. There's not a lot of fluff in this book at all right? Everything is very valuable and impactful. And I love that. So in chapter one, and this is a quote from your book, it says, our goal in becoming mindful listeners is to quiet the internal noise to allow the whole message and the messenger to be understood. In addition, when we listen mindfully to others, we help quiet down their internal noise. And you spoke on that um, just earlier about when you listen to them, it kind of helps calm them. And when you take that pause, that's where the gold nugget is. Because that's when we start to process things, not only as a listener, but as the communicator, they take that moment to reflect on what did they just say? And sometimes they find a little bit more. There's still some, I call it the water left in the hose, right? <laughs> because whenever we interrupt someone, it's like putting a kink in that hose. And when we put a kink in the hose, there's all this pressure building up. And until you release that pressure and let everything flow out, then you're not going to have that time to kind of open up that communication because people are inside their heads thinking of what am I going to say next? Or how are they interpreting this? Or there's just so much noise and static going on. So I want to talk about in today's climate, we are in a very emotionally uneasy climate right now. And you also mentioned that um, part of being a good listener is being relaxed and focused, but we are all in this state of stress and emotional arousal. And we're very quick to become defensive because we're in that self-preservation mode. So when we're in that really intense state, how can we listen? Because it seems that's the last thing we want to do in those moments. Mm -hmm. Very good point and a great metaphor with the kink in the hose. That's great because that is so much what goes on in someone's mind. It's trying to keep the flow of their thoughts and that continuity and seeing, looking to see if they're safe to share. See, that's what the pauses do. But uh, yes, it is a real issue. So what do we do when we know we are going to encounter a difficult situation? Let's say we're going to talk to someone on the up opposite side of the, of the political spectrum. Let's say that we're going to talk to a disgruntled customer or a, uh, a, a very uh, angry child. I mean, so what do we do? Well, first, we have to quiet our mind, and we have to breathe, and we have to take a step back and say, what is the outcome that I would like to have with this person? After this conversation is over, how do I want to see things happening? Well, I realize that because this person is emotionally distorted right now, or very upset, or is going to have some very, very strong opinions that I may have trouble with, I better take the responsibility myself to set up the tone. I can't expect them to, right? And yeah. that's fine. So we take that responsibility and we breathe and we calm down and we identify what are the internal distractions that are very likely to get in the way when I start talking with this person or listening to them. And I want to acknowledge them and I know how I can get. I can, you know, get very upset and this is where the emotions get in the way. But that's not going to help the outcome now, is it? Right. So I'm going to step back and I'm going to say, all right, this may be a difficult conversation. But my goal, if nothing else, is to leave understanding that person better. And if they get the feeling that I'm just wanting to understand them better, then they may calm down too. And this is how, you know, if you're an emotionally intelligent person, you can influence the emotions of others, right? 
So that is how I would say so. And, and, you know, of course, then that particular person may come back and ask you a question about your beliefs, because by the way, if you listen to someone wholeheartedly, well, they're a little bit more apt to listen to you. Right? So that's when you've got to choose your words carefully. Go by the facts. No hyperbole. <laughs> no, no narratives that, or, or, or um, high-powered words that could, you know, ex excite them. So you see how it's listening to them, but also listening to yourself when it's your turn to talk. That's how I approach those situations. That's my recommendation. And I think that is spot on. And when you practice this, you become better at it. But it's going to take time, right? In theory, that sounds amazing. And in practice, it's, it's definitely possible. But you have to get in the right state of mind. Because all of us want to be heard. I think that is one thing that so many people are lacking right now is the feeling of not being heard. So to come from a place of understanding first is really challenging. Because I want you to hear me first. I need to relieve this pressure first. So it takes... Um, not practice. What is the word I'm looking for? Do you know what I'm trying to, uh, no, it mm, discipline, take it takes discipline. It's not a habit we're into, you know? Right. But we have to be disciplined enough to put our needs aside for a moment and, and try to come from that place of understanding. And whenever we hear someone say something that we believe is completely absurd and not true, cause you're talking about facts that's a messy subject too, because a lot of people wholeheartedly believe, no, this is a fact. This is not my opinion. This is a fact. We've lost mm -hmm. what a fact truly means. What is an objective observation versus what is just information that we are labeling as a fact? So how do you handle a conversation where the other person is presenting information as a fact? How do you calmly mm -hmm. talk them through that so that they are being heard, you're understanding them, but you can also have that conversation that kind of throws that on the table that mm, this is your opinion, you know, it's not mm -hmm. necessarily a fact. Mm -hmm. Well, that is very challenging, Brittany, because there again, we're putting ourselves, if that's our, if that's our outcome, if that's what we want to be able to do is change their mind or to help them see clearer what they're saying or to analyze themselves and their point of view, mm, that's we're kind it. of looking to change them and they can pick up on that, right? And I don't so, want to change anyone. So I want to, how do you approach it in a way that's not trying to change their mind or tell them that they were, are wrong? but more so that their statement is an opinion. Okay, well, you can say, can you give me some evidence of this? Can you give me some document, documented evidence? Can you oh, give they have me video evidence? <laughs> can you show me something in print that, and, and I have to be careful there because the media, you know, yeah. is, is, I wouldn't say the most objective and fact-based. Exactly. Okay. But I would say, give me some evidence of that. That's interesting that you should say that. Give me some evidence of this. So that is what sometimes paints them into a corner when they have to provide some actual evidence or quantifiable means of supporting their opinion. That's a, probably about as far as I would go. And you will notice when you hear someone presenting a narrative or an agenda as their opinion and calling it facts, when you ask them for the evidence of this, it gets very quiet in the room. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes. I feel like nowadays with what's going on politically, like you said, there's so much information out there. They have facts. They have air quotes. They have facts to throw at you. Okay. But then everybody has their own facts. And mm -hmm. how do you distinguish? And I think, you know, for me, because I've had these conversations with a few people that believe very differently than I do, and they deem my facts as false data, but theirs is real data. And I said, well, but how do you distinguish what's real and what's false? Well, your facts, somebody's pushing their own personal agenda. 
but you don't even know the source. You didn't even ask the source of my information. Um, and, and that's, that's the frustration that I'm facing now is that even when we apply these listening strategies, if the other person is dead set, and I think you talk about that in your book, when someone is dead set on their belief, it's almost like it doesn't go anywhere. You literally just have to listen, build that rapport with them, that trust over a longer period of time before you even try to voice your opinion on the matter. Would you agree? Mm, yes, very good. Look, you know, this is one of the myths about listening that you have to agree with what that person is saying, that you have to change minds. That it's great to be open to changing your mind. And one of the ways to do that, or just to get people to rethink their position or to look a little deeper in what they have to say, I probably wouldn't even go so far. If I, if I can't get the evidence, I'm not going to keep pressing because that's going to stop the conversation and put it to, a, you know, put it to an end. But I would like to be able to say, look, I would like this outcome of this challenging conversation that I might be having with someone to say, I want to be able to understand where they're coming from. Because if I exert that kind of concentration and focus, if I don't ask too many questions, I let them go on, then they just might want to hear from me. And if they can hear from me and digest it in the way I digested their point of view, well, maybe they will rethink what they're talking about. Maybe they will either have their opinion justified and supported, or perhaps they'll wonder, gee, you know, maybe I have to think this through again. This was a challenging conversation. I guess I need to think through my point of view. So at best, that could be the that could be the outcome you're you're shooting for. Yeah. And I think too, instead of just um, when we go into a conversation, I think we want to have that that balanced, um, like an, a level playing field. I hear you, you hear me. But sometimes it's best if it's not solicited, if they don't want to hear what you're saying, instead of providing that, just end it there. I mean. I think that would blow a ton of people's minds. If you listen to them, they ask how you feel about it and say, well, I don't see the same way you do. And then leave it there and see if they want, well, how do you feel about it? Well, if I disagree with you, are you open to hearing my point of view? You know, coming with questions. So then if they provide you with, or if you provide them with information that they don't agree with, they've already agreed to hearing you out. Oh, yeah. sure. They'll hear you. There's hearing and there's, then there's listening. There's true. <laughs> true. Very true. Yeah. Let's talk well, about you know, Go ahead. Let's talk about this movie. You talk about um, playing out a movie in your head when you're listening to someone. What what do you mean by that? Because the listeners who haven't read this book, they're like, movie? What? Okay. Well, people will say to me, I'm not a good listener. I'll never be a good listener. It's just not me. And I'll say, Oh, really? I'll say, um, is there anything that you do listen to well? And they'll say, well, maybe when I go to the movies, maybe when I watch a movie, then I will listen to that. And I'll say, oh, wonderful, because that means you can be a good listener. So how do we take that movie mindset and apply it, particularly in the kinds of situations you just described? Well, let's talk about what the movie experience is like. So when you go to the movies or you sit down to watch a Netflix or whatever, you put all your soap operas in another room. You put away all your stuff and you are ready for an escape. You're ready to forget yourself and get into the movie of someone else. In fact, you may be watching this, this movie and there might be a, a drug dealer from south of the border. And you're, of course you might have your biases and your judgments against drugs and all, but you know, that's, that's really not in play when you're in the movie. You're trying to understand, there's that word again, where they're coming from, what makes them say and do the things they do. I just want to understand. I want to listen with curiosity. Now, so I've forgotten myself, isn't that refreshing, and gotten into their movie. And when I walk out of that theater or when I shut down my computer or turn off the movie, I'm, I'm changed a little bit. 
I, I understand this kind of personality a little bit better, where he came from, what made him do these things. I, I'm understanding better. I've changed as a person because of losing myself, forgetting myself, and getting into the movie of someone else. Now, this is a mindset we all can relate to, but what it does is very powerful. First of all, if Brittany, you're telling me about yourself, I really want to understand you. I want to get into your movie and you'll sense that right away because I'm not interrupting you. I'm not denying your experience. I'm not correcting you or doing anything like that. And you're getting the sense that you've been heard wholeheartedly. And you know how many people can say they've been heard wholeheartedly in their lives? A handful. Yeah, very few. So that's the movie mindset. So whenever I go in, into a conversation with someone, particularly a difficult person, I will just shift to that movie mindset. I'm curious as to why they're feeling the way they feel or believe what they believe. I, I want to understand. And the movie mindset is pretty easy to shift into. Makes you feel very successful. <laughs> uh, from yeah. the mm -hmm. It's great. That was very helpful for me. That was one of the first strategies that I used. And it made a world of difference because I always wanted to speak up and interject in conversation. Even if it wasn't an unpleasant conversation, it was, I have an idea. I want to throw my two cents into this meeting, right? And I don't fully hear everyone else. And they say that a good leader is the last to speak because they let everyone else put their thoughts in, and then they usually, usually reply with questions mm -hmm. to dig a little bit deeper. Correct. Correct. But in corporate America, sometimes it's just the yeah. opposite. You see that a lot. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many um, people that get into leadership positions that it's like you scratch your head and think, how in the world did you get there? You know, but I think the mindset of leadership is changing. Now people are starting to understand that humility and understanding and emotional intelligence, these essential skills aren't just fluff. They're very important. And that ruling with fear and hierarchy isn't getting the same results that, you know, these other organizations that are applying these essential skills into their day-to-day -day practice. But that goes back to instead of having these surface level techniques that you mentioned, really embodying and embracing this. And I think that is something we cannot teach. We can instruct on how to better do that, but it starts with that individual really adopting that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you encourage people? I always ask people that I interview, how do you encourage people to approach these skills with authenticity and truly embrace them? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would ask them to say, what kind of an outcome do they want from this particular relationship? Is it important to you? Is this person precious and important to you? Is there any value for improving your emotional intelligence, i.e. You know, your, mm -hmm. your mindful listening ability? Yeah. You know, mindful listening takes up a lot of ground under that, that emotional intelligence spectrum. So what's the benefit? Do you care about having more harmonious relationship? If you're a leader, do you want to be appreciated for being a, an intimidator or do you want to be admired? How about that? Um, are you interested in for, let's say, and I work with a lot of startups. One of the things I do is I, I coach entrepreneurs for improving their ability to communicate and connect with their people. And I say to them, hey, you know, if you become a mindful listener, you've got the extra edge in customer service. You know, if you have a competitive industry, hey, make mindful listening a standard in your business. You know? um, for your good health and maybe the health of the person who is speaking. Your good health, your ability to calm yourself and be in control of your emotions. Isn't that a healthy thing? Also, you know that mindful listening practiced in the way that I've described is brain training. It makes you smarter. It helps you be more accountable for the information that passes through your ears. 
you know? Um, and it also helps you uh, from a stress point of view and a health point of view deal better with difficult people. As a matter of fact, the more that I practice mindful listening, Brittany, the less difficult people I encounter. Yes. Because I don't see them as difficult. I see them exactly. as interesting, curious. I'd like to know why they're so disgruntled. Why is that? So you can turn difficult people into pretty comfortable, pleasant people <laughs> yeah. by listening to them. Well, we're not absorbing that energy that they're bringing to us either. We're not taking it on as our responsibility or an attack on us. We just observe it and say, hmm, they're really angry about something. Yeah, that's interesting. What, what are, are they worried? angry about, you know? And yeah. how it, have I potentially influenced that anger? And how can I listen and help alleviate that feeling? What is the need behind that emotion? So let's talk about that. Because when we're listening and we're hearing people, sometimes the words that come out of their mouth is not the message. So we have to become detectives and really try to identify maybe that hidden message in our communication. Mm -hmm. So how would you suggest looking for that hidden message mm -hmm. when it's not in the words? Right. Well, you know, when people expect resistance, they'll come out with the most vile, uh, pretentious, um, sarcastic, use of words, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared for that because they're ready for a fight. Oftentimes they're ready. They're ready for the resistance that they typically get from people who are not good listeners. So you have to be prepared for that. But then the more that you get into their movie and they pick up on that, the more you get into their movie and try to show that you want to understand their rhetoric lightens up. They start to slow down. Physically, they become less emphatic, less reactive. And before you know it, they're starting to speak in a more civil way. They're starting to speak in more of a way of trying to get across how they feel or what they want to say or their conflicts. At that point, you've got them where you want them without being manipulative in, in that sense of the word. Right. Now you're at a better place. You're at a more level playing field where you can resolve that issue or at least let them know that they've been heard at worst. And they both, both of us walk away feeling better about the interaction. Again, it's what kind of an outcome do I want to have here? And accepting the responsibility that it's probably my responsibility to help this person. Their emotions are out of control, but as an emotionally intelligent person, I'm going to try to harness my emotions, yeah. step back and see if I can influence them and help them feel better after that interaction. Responsibility is so key. Gosh, we get into this victim mindset oftentimes, and we also look for anything or anyone to pin the blame on. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're feeling a certain emotion, we usually say they made me feel this way, or you made me feel that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody can make us feel any way. And when we realize that, and we accept that, like you said, that 100% responsibility, that is so important. Whenever we feel those feelings arise, we can have that internal dialogue with ourselves to say, Hmm, what about what they said triggered me? Mm -hmm. And you talk about internal dialogue, listening to yourself as well. It's not just about listening to someone outside of yourself. So how does that come into play? The internal voice within? Yeah. Well, we do need to know our triggers. That's why I said before you engage in a conversation, in a difficult conversation, know what your triggers are. Is it swear words? Is it uh, getting too close to you? Is it um, uh, agendas and narratives that have no basis of fact. Mm -hmm. What are your triggers? Know them well. Wouldn't you say, and you're the emotional intelligence expert, wouldn't you say that it's important for you to be aware, as you said, aware of your triggers, aware of the emotions that may rise within you, aware mm -hmm. of your internal distractions? Yeah. That's how you begin to manage them. 
So again, Brittany, it's that preparation and knowing what those triggers are so that you don't fall victim to them and become part of the problem in the conversation. Right, right. I find that mental rehearsal is fantastic for working through this. I actually just recorded a module for my program today on Mm self-regulation. And I talk about an experience that I had on LinkedIn just a few months ago when I was trying to solicit feedback from someone that was an ideal prospect. I fully disclosed everything that I was doing, right? I'm trying to get information so I can better serve this demographic. And they replied back with, um, great hook or something like that. I'm not interested in what you're selling me. And it just instantly triggered something in me. I just felt anger and I was appalled that you don't know me, you know? And so I processed that internal dialogue. And at first the internal dialogue was very judgmental. It was, um, you know, how dare you accuse me of doing this? People like you are the problem. But here's the thing, that dialogue stayed in my head. And after I went through that with how I felt and I said that to myself, then I kind of took a step back, calmed down and said, okay, what perspective, how can I put myself in their shoes and see where they're coming from? You know, so many people, as you said before, are portraying this authenticity that's just a facade. And because it is becoming the norm, people just don't know who they can trust. So they assume based on prior experiences that if you come at me this way, you clearly have an intent. There's a hook. You're trying to sell me on something. Mm -hmm. And so I empathized with him because I've been there. The difference, however, is I don't assume people's intent because I'm not a mind reader. I go into it a little more cautious. So once I process that, then I replied with, I'm sorry you feel that way. This isn't a hook. I, there is no intent to sell. I was genuinely trying to get information. Uh, I feel like it's unfortunate that you're skeptical potentially due to disingenuine um, request, but uh, all the best. And then I sent it. But so many times I feel like that internal internal dialogue is what erupts out of us like a cannon before we have time to reflect and process that. Wow. Good for you to pause, take some time to step back 30,000 feet and say, huh, how did that happen? How do I react? How do I respond in an emotionally intelligent way? Good for you. It's like, don't click send. (laughs) <laughs> until you slept on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I can, I can do that a little bit faster now, but before I used to, I mean, I know you don't know me, but I used to be the person that was labeled as crazy. Um, I would, well, my boyfriend at the time would stop getting invited to things by his friends because they knew I would be there. Cause I was the one who was going to make a scene. I didn't care how I looked, how I came across. If you said or did something that I didn't like, you would know it. And so would anyone else within a certain radius, (laughs) you know? And, um, but I was also in that victim mindset. I was blaming everyone for my reactions to things. Well, if you didn't do this, or if you didn't say that, then I wouldn't have reacted that way, Mm -hmm. but I know better now. Mm -hmm. And when you take that a hundred percent responsibility for your actions, then you don't have a good excuse. So you better keep yourself in check, right? <laughs> good for you. Good for you. It would have been interesting to have a conversation with that person. And again, I mean, that's really taking it to the nth degree, but to say, hey, I'm just curious. What made you think that I was trying to sell you something? I just want to understand. And yeah. what you'll hear is, wow, how did I miss that boat? Or I guess I used some trigger words in there that made them think I was... I'm going to have to go back and revise my copy maybe because if she thought that, well, then maybe, you know, 15 other people thought the same Mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, so it does make us become more mindful listening to ourselves and putting out information 
a speaking, writing in a way that is more conscious, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a, a wonderful skill to have. So you said you had some stories in your pocket in the beginning that uh, you, you wouldn't mind sharing. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what are some, I'm, I'm sure obviously it has to do with listening, but I would love to hear some of the stories that you said that you had that you wouldn't mind sharing. Well, there are so many of them, so many times when I just got lost in the movie of the person and that experience ended changing, ended up changing them in so many ways, mm -hmm. ways that were so much more pow powerful than the intent that I had from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> probably one of the most notable ones and, and very w wonderful ones to look back at was an experience when I was at the clinic and uh, we had something called grand rounds in the head and neck uh, tumor end of otolaryngology. And as a speech pathologist, when a client would come in or a patient would come in with throat cancer, it was up to me to teach them how to swallow, how to speak. Um, and I, was, I would be in on this grand rounds. And so you can imagine a room full of specialists and the poor patient comes in and sits in a chair and everyone goes around and examines the patient and asks him, him or her questions. And then the patient leaves the room and we discuss treatment. Okay. So you can imagine it's a, it's a necessary process, but it's a process that's very alienating for the patient, you know, imagine. Well, I remember one particular incident, there was a gentleman who came from far away for his treatment and he came in and he was a, uh, a, a little guy, uh, probably in his 50s, um, and, and very, very timid and, and nervous, you could tell. Understandable, you know, he has this diagnosis. And he was probed and, and prodded by all of us. And then when he left the room, I figured, well, that's the end of that. Later on that day, I went down to the cafeteria, this is maybe a couple hours afterwards, and I saw him and his wife in the corner. You could tell that he was very agitated. He was very upset. His wife had her face in her hands and it was very sad. And I just felt compelled to walk over there. And I said, Mr. Smith, that wasn't his name, but uh, how are you? Gee, thank you so much for coming to rounds today. We really want to try to help you and get to the bottom of things. And he was just shaking in his voice and saying, I, I don't understand what my problem is. I don't understand what they might do to me. What, what I don't understand and the wife felt the same way and I said oh, wow I pulled out a paper napkin in the little dispenser there and I said let me draw you a picture all I had was a pen in my pocket <laughs> so I said let me draw you a picture of what your larynx looks like what your vocal cords look like and the problem and some ideas as, as to what is going to go on next so you have a better understanding all of a sudden he started to calm down I wasn't giving them any kind of um, pretense or uh, I wasn't swinging the lingo, the medical jargon. I was trying to speak in his terms so he would understand him and his wife. So I drew the picture and I also wrote in code, uh, I mean, in very abbreviated manner, but very simple to understand some of the treatments that, that we're talking about. Well, they felt be much better after that. Uh, we talked for a little bit and I understood where he was coming from. And uh, then I walked away and I said, All right, good luck, Mr. Smith. We'll see you in a, in a few weeks. Let's see how things go. Well, wouldn't you know it, about four weeks later, all of a sudden, I saw his wife, <laughs> I'm standing in line, his wife waving that paper napkin at me with a big <laughs> smile on his face. <laughs> and, say, and I went out there and said, how are you doing? Mr. Smith, and he was definitely, you know, improving from his surgery. And uh, she was waving the napkin and saying it had coffee stains all over it. But obviously, you know, it had its tour from relative to friend to relative again. And she said, this saved us. This helped mm -hmm. us understand this whole process. And they were so appreciative. She says, I'm never throwing this napkin away. Wow. And it was probably the most um, inspiring um, experience of my life to see how picking my words wisely, listening to him and understanding where they're coming from helped me help him achieve better health and perhaps 
help that mental health of the spouse. It was quite a story, quite an experience. That's amazing. And it's those little things, just that genuine care that makes such a world, such a world of difference. You know, we don't even realize people want to do these random acts of kindness. So they do what they've seen other people do and post things, but it's, you don't need a, a playbook to do this stuff. It's you just see someone in need and, you know, have that genuine, authentic conversation. But I think things have just become so transactional in our society. It's sad. Um, it kind of reminds me, and I talk about this in my book, Good Vibes at the DMV. So I don't know if the DMV is like this in every state, but they get a bad rap, you know, here in North Carolina. Everybody's like, oh, the TSA and the DMV are people that are just always miserable. That's usually the label that people slap on them. And so while I was at the DMV, I was standing in line and I was just observing the interactions between the clerks and the people coming in. And I started to notice that it was very transactional. You know, they would say, how are you? The person usually wouldn't even respond or even have time to respond before they said, how can I help you today? You know, just that rote conversation. And then I would notice that the clerks were getting very frustrated because a lot of the people coming there were fighting the payments. Oh, I'm not paying that late fee. I'm not doing this. Or what do you mean I need this information? I didn't know I needed this information where they're like, you know, it's on our website. Well, I'm not going to go to your website. So there was just a lot of emotional and uh, tension back and forth. It's like the person going to the DMV was already to put up a fight because they knew they were dealing with this already miserable person, you know, and then vice versa. So I get to the front and the first thing I said was, she asked how I was and I said, I'm great. How are you doing today? She was like, I'm, she was like, I'm good, you know, but it was still very transactional because some people ask, how are you? And she was like, I'm good. I said, well, I hope I have everything for you. I went on your website. I tried to get everything together. So I hope I've prepared enough for you. And so now I'm starting to see a little bit different expression on her face because she's like, oh, this person's actually trying to make life easy for me. <laughs> and so I give it to her and um, she was extremely fast at processing my paperwork. And she was like, all right, you're ready to go. I was like, wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much for being so quick in taking care of this for me. I really appreciate it. So I hope you have a great day. And she just got this big smile on her face, her face lit up. She was like, thank you so much, you too. And then when she called the next person in line, she just had a little bit more cheerfulness in her voice. It's simple things, really showing people that you see them, you hear them, you understand them. I didn't really listen too much to her. There wasn't much dialogue, but it was me um, being active at understanding without having to listen. You know, we can do that as well. If you see someone's down, just like you did, that's exactly what you did. You observed Mr. Smith and his wife feeling that discomfort. You picked up on that and then you offered to under come from a place of understanding and explain. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Well and it makes you feel so good. I mean, you carry that with you um, for years and they carry that with them for years. That's the point. Do you, do you realize what a ripple effect you yeah. created that day by giving someone a compliment? Yeah. I mean, it's probably still going on. It's, you know, the next person may, was made to feel a little bit better by that. And they took that with them, the person that you complimented, her family, her friends, anyone she came in contact with, maybe she lent a compliment, which started the whole force up again. <laughs> well, you know? even with your situation. So I don't know how old Mr. Smith and his wife were, but let's say they had children. They were old enough to have children that were old enough to understand what you did. Let's say they're in their teens. 
And they come home and talk about that and they see how you changed that experience for them. People have told stories about people like you who have offered that um, support and it made them want to become a healthcare professional Mm -hmm. just from that interaction because they wanted to do that exact same thing for someone else because they saw the impact that it made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It keeps going and going and going. And on the same note, we don't realize the negative ripples that we can um, set off just by not listening to someone or not, uh, you know, or, or coming at someone with our labels and judgments and assumptions. So we have to ask ourselves, which ripple are we wanting to set into effect, positive or a negative? You know, right. That's the challenge for the day. How do you want to interact with people today? You may have some difficult people in your life to listen to, but maybe they're there for a reason to teach you a lesson as to how to listen to yourself better. Um, but yeah, set the tone for the day and say, how do I want, how many lives do I want to impact today positively? And at the end of the day, did I do what I said I wanted to do? And did I hurt anybody's feelings? Did I cut anyone off? Could I have done a better job with certain conversations over others? Hmm, Well, that's interesting. I'm I'm gonna make that better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a very powerful force listening. Doesn't take a whole lot of effort. There are ways to make it easy, but even 1% change in the way you connect with people can have a compound effect over time. Nice reflection there, Brittany. So some key so some key points in this conversation is I think first and foremost, come from a place of understanding. And I, I want to add compassion into that. Sure. Self-compassion as well, right? Listening to our internal dialogue and not being judgmental, not saying I should have, I shouldn't have, that was bad, this is good. It's I did this, I said that, I felt this way, and this is how I want to go forward. This is what I want to do instead of should do, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think another takeaway is take full responsibility for your response, your listening skills, your assumptions, your judgments, everything that's going on within you while you're listening. If you have trouble listening to someone, see it as a movie, get into their movie. Right. And what are, so those are my three takeaways. I would love to hear what some of your takeaways are for this conversation. Well, I think you hit on the most important ones, actually. I, I, I think it's important for us to understand that listening does not mean you have to agree with someone. Mm-hmm. Um, it does not mean that you are in a weaker position. It means that you are really in a position to take in much more of the message and much greater understanding yes. than if you were to do the talking. Um, it doesn't take too much time for someone to feel they've been heard wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. These are just some of the defenses. These are just some of the defenses that people have in their head about listening that prevent them from wanting to do what you did, from reaching out to, to getting into the movie, to trying to understand someone, not to criticize, but just try to understand and listen with curiosity because you will be richer for that. Yes. You will understand people for that. And you will also make someone feel very good about themselves. So I think you hit on on the main points right there, Brittany. I love that you said curiosity. Diving a little bit deeper. Tell me more about that. Yes. Oh, or yeah. how, did, how did you come to that realization? Tell me more. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's the last thing that, that an angry person expects you to say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Could you imagine? Like, and, and I think that's the thing. People are ready for, for a fight. They're already prepared for a fight because they know that most people are going to come at them with their information. But if you said, hmm, I mean, that's not how I personally see it, but tell me more about that. <laughs> well, okay, well. And, then and they, you've already, and that, you know, 
They want yeah. to hear more from you. See, and then you have a dialogue going versus a monologue. You see? Exactly. And you disclose by saying, well, that's not how I see it, but I would love to hear more about that. You've already said that you don't see it the same way as them, but you're still interested in learning more, right? It goes back to that not having to agree. All you want to do is get the information so you can understand them better or understand the topic better. But some people, just, <laughs> people just cut it off at, well, let's just agree to disagree. And we still don't get anywhere with that. We can agree to disagree all we want, mm -hmm. but you walk away being no less informed and I walk away being no less informed or understanding. You know, we just say, well, we're just going to cut ties and let it be what it is. Yeah. yeah. Where's the good in that? Well, I absolutely, I'm so grateful I found your book and I'm going through it again for the second time, reading it again, because there's so many good nuggets in here that just will never go out of style. It is a timeless book. So for those of you listening to this conversation, this podcast, this show, um, you can find it on Amazon. Can you go into a bookstore and is it in their catalog? Is it in catalogs at bookstores? It's probably, it's still in print, but it's not, uh, you know, the most recent books are in the bookstores, the, you know, the brick and mortar okay. bookstores right now, but people can order it on Amazon, the hard copy, it's still in print and they can listen to it on audible.com. Audible. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and listening to your story today. Thank, Thank you, Brittany. So it was a pleasure to get to know you also. Thank, Thank you. you.